Hey, everybody, join the all new members area on my Before the Lights podcast website. The Salute Chin Chin Package includes access to the extra five, shout out on a future show, some bonus content, the Zoom calls. Also, we're going to have some rewards for you. Get the brand new limited edition poker chip. It looks absolutely fantastic. You're going to get 10% off all merch as well. Your name added to the show notes. To join for only $7.99 a month, go to beforethelightspod.com slash support. That's beforethelightspod.com slash support. Hey, everybody. It's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Today, we have an actress, jazz vocalist. She's known as Mama Williams on the TV series Friday Night Lights and Ruthie Jenkins and Welcome Home Roscoe. She has performed on stage for over 30 years and is a fixture on the Dallas theater scene. Her voice is described as immense and joyful. She received the Sankofa Award for dedication to the arts in the community and is a voiceover talent and accomplished dancer. She is also described as a powerhouse, a Texas native. Please welcome to the show, Liz Michael. Liz, welcome to Before the Lights. I am so grateful. I'm good. How are you? I am excited and honored to have you on the show. I am a fan of your on-screen work, and I thought you did an absolutely phenomenal job in Friday Night Lights series, which we're going to get to. I'm a fan of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's start back here. What does or did your mother and grandmother mean to you? Oh, uh, now, why would you start it off with this? Because you know I'm going to start crying right off the bat. Oh, my goodness. I'll start with my uh, maternal grandmother, uh, who I was named after. I was named after both maternal and paternal grandmothers. Um, my maternal grandmother was the most loving beautiful soul and grounded. Um, She instilled in my mother and her sisters, my aunts, um, uh, um, a love of family and community. And um, she led by example. Now, when I talk about that, that leads me to my mother, who, because my grandmother was very active in the community, Um, and working in schools and all of that, the principal of the elementary school, uh, my mother was the youngest of three daughters. The the principal kept bugging my grandmother. Well, when are you sending Versia to school? When are you sending Versia to school? My mother was three. And the principal kept after my grandmother. And finally she said, here, there she is. (laughs) My mother started the first grade, not kindergarten, not pre-K, the first grade grade at three years old. She graduated high school valedictorian, senior class president at 15, had her bachelor's in biology at 19, and her master's at 21, and started teaching college. Um, She went on uh, later because she uh, ended up, she was teaching college. She met my father and got married, but she kept going after her doctorate. And my mother ended up with a PhD in radiation biology and molecular chemistry. But along with that, with that left side of her brain, her right side always had this appreciation for arts. So my mother, while she was in high school, started taking vocal lessons and was a trained coloratur. She sang, she would have recitals, people would come. And during those times back in the 40s and 50s, she would sing on radio programs, Uh, And then when I popped out, this little artist baby, uh, (laughs) I kept begging her at three years old to be a ballerina. Mama, I want to be a ballerina. Mama, I want to be a ballerina. Mama, I can be a ballerina. Mama, look, I want to be a ballerina. And finally, at the age of five, my mother did a similar thing that my grandmother did. She took me to one of her colleagues, Ann Williams, who was the founder of Dallas Black Dance Theater, a world-renowned dance company. And she was a a colleague of my mother's at Bishop College. She said, Ann, take her. And I started my formal ballet training at five years old. My mother and I grew on to 6'1". I'm 6'1". So I went to the high school for performing arts at 13. 
And I was a dance major there and I majored in dance in college. I switched my major, but my mother never told me my dreams were too big or that I was too big. Uh, so my mother and my grandmother, they raised the bar. Yes, they did. <laughs> they raised the bar. <laughs> Can you then say that your infectious spirit comes from them or does it come from other places as well? Well, it, there's no doubt, uh, you know, um, the lineage is strong. And um, I, I picked up that baton without knowing I had picked up that baton. But I was also nurtured by people in my community, um, other artists, other people who knew my mother, um, other people who saw me, this this young kid wanting to do these things. And they were like, well, come here, come here. We, we'll train you. We'll we'll help you. And so it was, it's a combination of all of that, but my foundation, yes, by all means, my mother, my grandmother, my father, my grandfather, my family. You changed your major to theater after your freshman year in college. What were you going to go to original theater? Dance. I was dance. a dance major. Okay. I was a dance major and my dance instructor, Melvin Purnell, who was with the uh, dance theater of Harlem brought in the founder, Arthur Mitchell, to one of our classes to do a master class. And he brought this stick. And as I said, I'm 6'1", I'm over 200 pounds, I'm a big girl. And it, the class was so intense and I was still just, you know, in it. But I started thinking, I said, either I would have to choreograph or have my own dance company. I wanted to spend time on stage, living my best life, you know, <laughs> expressing myself on stage. And um, those, those thoughts, prompted me to change my major to theater and not even musical theater. Uh, yeah, I changed my major because I was bruised up and skint <laughs> up from that master dance class, child. 1992, you're in a TV movie, The Quest for Freedom. What do you remember about that job and what did you take from it? It was my very first um, booking as far as film, TV, anything like that. And I remember being terrified. I remember driving uh, to location. I was also doing, at the time, Nonsense in Austin, Texas at the Live Oak Theater. And I had to drive in to Dallas and then drive past Dallas. I think we shot it in, it, it was not Ben Wheeler, but it was right outside of Dallas in East Texas. It might've even been uh, Terrell. Uh, but I was uh, excited and nervous because that was my first on-camera gig. How did you, Liz, get your break into Broadway? Well, actually, um, it, because I've been here at the Dallas Theater Center, where I'm a company member, the Tony Award winning regional uh, Tony Award winning theater here in Dallas. I've been uh, at the Dallas Theater Center since 1991. And in 2008, a wonderful man by the name of Kevin Mariardi took over as artistic director. And he uh, formed, the, the company had disbanded when I first got there in uh, 91. Uh, 92, that company disbanded. Another artistic director um, started bringing people in from uh, other parts of the country. And so all of the artists that, that worked and lived here in the Metroplex kind of dispersed. There were a few that stayed, but you know, you make your living making art for a living. And um, that was redundant, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, I, we choose to live in the community that we work in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that artistic director kind of disbanded the art, the artistic company of the band of actors. But in 2008, another artistic director came in and said, I want to resurrect that family feel that community vibe of artists who live in our community, who are dedicated to uh, living and making art here in the best light possible. And that was Kevin Moriarty. Well, in 2009, we opened a new performance space, the Wiley Theater, downtown Dallas, in what's now the Arts District. I had been down there since 77 when I went to high school, and it wasn't considered the Arts District at that time. But they've, they've created a opera house, the Symphony Center, uh, where we perform along with Dallas Black Dance at the Wiley Theater. The High School for Performing Arts is there. The City uh, Performing House is there. It's, it's wonderful. At any rate, Kevin was a dear friend of uh, another wonderful man, um, 
Dan Connectus, who was doing big things at the time. And Dan had a connection with uh, Douglas Carter Bean, who wrote Two Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. He did uh, Sister Act Two. He did uh, Xanadu, other Broadway shows and movies. And he was developing a... Um, a piece about a football, I mean, a basketball team. That, and he loosely based it on the Greek comedy Lysistrata, where women withheld sex from the men until they uh, uh, won a war. Well, in this, the cheerleaders withheld sex from the basketball team until they won a game because they were just, you know, uh, uh, resigned to losing everything. And so when Kevin heard about that piece uh, and it was the whole thing was kind of set up and led by this all-knowing muse, um, larger than life madam that kind of orchestrated everything between the cheerleaders and the basketball boys. And Kevin heard about it. He And then he read the script. He was like, we have an actress that would be perfect in this role, Liz Michael. So I flew up to New York, read the script with them, and then I just waited. The next thing I knew... Um, they, the, my theater, the Dallas Theater Center, picked it up and and produced it. And when they produced it, um, it was a hit here in Dallas. It was called Give It Up at the time. Mm. It was a wonderful new musical starring Andrew Rammels, who some of your, your uh, listeners may know. Um, Andrew has gone on to do huge things. He's, I, I mean... I watch him now on Black Monday, the, the show on Showtime, but Andrew's blown up. Uh, Patty Murin, um, uh, Telly Leong. There were a number of up-and-coming Broadway stars that were involved in it here in Dallas. And the next thing I knew, the next year, a year later, Van called me and said, hey, we're going off-Broadway with this show. Um Doug is real good friends with Whoopi Goldberg and we're looking at her to take over your role. Would you think about coming and maybe understudying uh, Whoopi, you know, when her schedule gets busy? And I mulled it over and I talked to people and they were like, I don't know. Then Whoopi fell through and Dan called back and said, okay, Whoopi's out. Will you take the role? I know it's big. You know, we can't pay you much. We'll fly you up. We'll find somewhere for you to stay. It was off Broadway. So they didn't have all of these resources. And I mulled it over and I thought about it. And God in his infinite wisdom, God, I, I had uh, filed some back taxes and I didn't get one tax return. I didn't <laughs> get two tax returns. I got three. And so that was God saying, hey, you can go up there. My kid was in school at the time. My youngest daughter um, was uh, 15 at the time, 16, 16 at the time. And so it, it it made it possible for me to be able to go. The next thing I knew, Tommy, that whole project from Off-Broadway blew up. And before the show closed, they announced that we were going to Broadway. And wow. it was just unreal that I never auditioned for Broadway. I never set my sights. So I'm going to Broadway. They called and said, hey, will you come and do this show? <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of people that are jealous of that story right now of how you got to Broadway. <laughs> well, and I'm going back. So and that was another thing that I, I just received the call. You know, you put out the work, you do the work. And uh, I did the work with another dear, dear friend. Um, her name is Eve Insler. Well, she's now the uh, formerly known as Eve Insler, the uh, wonderful activist and playwright who created the Vagina Monologues. Mm. And I did a show for her off Broadway uh, in 2018. And Diane Paulus, the Tony Award winning artistic director of American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, came to see it. And um, through those conversations of e V and Diane, Diane reached out to me and said, hey, I'm doing a, a, a rethinking of 1776, the musical. Will you come and, and be a part of our workshop? And I went and went to the workshop in 2019. And then I got the call and said, hey, we're going on tour and to Broadway with this show. Would you be interested? <laughs> so I just have to say, hell yeah. That's right. So <laughs> Liz, what was it like for you stepping in for Oprah, a vagina monologues on the 10th anniversary V to the 10th? There we go. That's how I, I met V. Um, right before that happened. And it was it was crazy how the whole thing transpired. 
I, when I was doing Friday Night Lights, there was a group of ladies in Austin that asked me to be a part of a, um, a fundraiser for women in the military who had been sexually abused. Mm. And it was called uh, Military V-Day. I had no idea that V, Eve, would be there. And so I just, on my own dime, I went down and got me a room and, and they gave me the monologue and I did it. Well, after we did the show, uh, a lady came up to me and said, uh, Eve wants to meet you. Eve wants to meet you. I'm like, she wants to meet me, you know, and this, and she had just told earlier in the night about V to the 10th, the 10th anniversary, they were reclaiming uh, New Orleans and the Superdome where all these horrific things had happened during Katrina. And, you know, it was just, it, just horrible things that had happened in that Superdome and they wanted to reclaim it and call it super love and all of these lists of stars, Selma Hayek, Jane Fonda, uh, uh, you name it, all these, these big mega stars were going to be there. And all of a sudden this lady was in my face saying, you, you're coming to new Orleans. And I was like, I'm coming to new Orleans. Well, I went and I was over. I was just overcome with, I mean, it was Doris Roberts, Christine Lottie, Shirley Knight, Carrie Washington, Rosario Dawson, uh, I, 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 Jane Fonda, uh, Jennifer Hudson, Jennifer Beals. I mean, it just went on and on. And so I was minding my own business. She gave me a monologue and I was outside after we had a little run through rehearsal earlier in the day, the show was that evening and I was outside smoking a cigarette and going over my monologue. And somebody walked up to me and said, hey, uh, the, the, the telephone's for you. And I was like, for me? And it was Eve's assistant. And she said, listen, I need all of this information, but here's the, here's the point. Miss Winfrey won't be able to join us this evening and Eve wants you to do her monologue. Again, I'm like, wait a minute. You've got all these thoughts, <laughs> Terry Watch and Rosario. You, got, you want me? You want me to do it. And I said, well, what about the, the monologue that I just rehearsed? Uh, and she said, just, just follow the assistant. I'll tell you later. Well, a dear friend of mine was my publicist at the time. He had gone with me. We had been out in L.A. two days before doing a fundraiser. And uh, I met him by the time I got the, the, the monologue. He said, you're doing both. And I, I was just overcome. I read it that one time, Tommy. The poem was called, Hey, Miss Pat. It was about a lady from New Orleans who fed her community during the time of Katrina. And at the end of it was this powerful litany of inviting people to come on her, come to her house because she was cooking. She was cooking. She says, come on to my house because I'm cooking. I'm cooking up resistance and rage. Mm -hmm. I'm cooking up a government that'll care and a levy that will hold. Come on to my house because I'm cooking. I'm cooking. And it just, it, it, it was just overwhelming. And, and you don't know this, but New Orleans has a very, very, very special place in my heart, period. And because all of this was taking place in New Orleans, it's where I go to recharge personally. Uh, and the connection between that piece that was written for Oprah and me and my New Orleanian love just connected that it just was a fit. And so I connected with the piece immediately. And by the time I finished that litany, everybody was on their feet, screaming and hollering. I was crying. And, and I was told, don't leave the stage after I finished this poem. And so I come up and Eve had to let everybody know. She said, you know, this poem was written for Oprah. Oprah couldn't be here. Liz was the voice that you needed to hear tonight. And ladies and gentlemen, here is Miss Pat Henry. And the lady that the poem was written about walked up on the stage and there was another love fest. We were all crying, hugging, and it was, and it was an eruption of love in that place that night. And I, 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 I it was an outer body experience when I finished it. It was just like, I don't even remember getting back to my seat, but I remember sitting down and I was just, I, I, it was just like an electric charge was all over me. And Doris Roberts turned to me with tears running down her face. She said, Liz, Oprah couldn't have done what you did. Mm. I'll never forget you as long as I live. And then Christine Lottie was in this other ear saying, when did you know you were doing that? 
I said, earlier today, after we did our run through, she said, you little shit, you little <laughs> shit. And after that, Tommy, after we, they released us from that night, it was Val Kilmer, um, uh, 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 Dylan McDermott, who is Eve's uh, son. I, they were just all in my face. Jane Fonda was like, you, you. And I was, you want to talk about overwhelmed, overcome. And years later, I found out from V, when she invited me, she didn't have anywhere for me to be on that program. She just wanted me on it, but, and people were like, what are you doing? Why are you inviting this lady? You know, you've, you've given out all the poems. There's nowhere for her to be. And she told me, this is years later. She told me that she just followed her gut. And when uh, Oprah stepped out and couldn't be there, she said, that's why I invited her to be a part of this. She has the voice that these people need to hear. That is an unbelievable story and touching. I had no idea. And I absolutely love that story. That is phenomenal stuff right there, Liz. It's still out, out of body, out of body. Friday Night Lights. How did you hear about the show? And what was your audition process like? I heard about this show from my agent, Mary Collins. And the auditions were in Austin. And a dear friend of mine who was with another agent, but we were dear friends. She and I and my daughter got in my little handy van and drove to Austin to the audition. And I read over the, the sides and, you know, we talked on the way down there. It's about a two and a half, three hour drive to Austin from Dallas. And um, I said, oh, she's a nurse. So we ran to Walmart and bought scrub tops, you know, <laughs> for the audition. And when I walked in, I auditioned for uh, Jeffrey Reiner who was one of the producers. And in talking about it at the time, my kids were younger. Um, and at the time we just bonded over raising kids. And then I did, you know, I did the, the sides that I had been given. I did the script. I read the script for him, but that discussion, I think about me being a mother, being in the middle of raising teens um, and, and being a mother of three kids uh, being busy doing what I do and trying to instill in them to be good people and stewards and raise them as good people in our community and our world. I think that landed with Jeffrey. Uh, he saw the heart of a mother, um, but I, I left the audition in the room. I figured my friend had gotten it because she stayed in the room far longer than I did. And so we drove back to Dallas. That's, you know, what I've been trained to do as an actor. Sometimes you beat yourself. Why didn't I say this line this way? Why didn't I do it like that? Why didn't I think this thought before I delivered it? And then I've learned in recent years, well, in, in a number of years uh, since, leave it in the room. Do the audition. I have no control over it. I've put out what I put out in the room. I have to trust that. Just leave it in the room. So I had to leave it in the room that day, Tommy. And I guess about the next week or so, I got a call from my agent and said, hey, uh, it's between you and another actress. Uh, the actress is in L.A. Uh, one of the good things is she looks like one of the kids and you look like one of the kids. Well, I didn't know I looked like the son. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I looked like Gaius. <laughs> and. Uh, the next thing I got the call, it was, you know, hey, they, they're casting you. You're Karina Williams. And it's crazy because my daughter's name is Corinne. My middle daughter's name is Corinne. And my my aunt's last name was Williams. At any rate, um, I thought when I got it, I said, oh, they'll show his family or whatever. And it'll be, you know, we will be in the stands. They won't do a lot of background. You know, I'm just thinking, oh, they just need to lock him up with a family and kind of show. I had no idea that it would dig as deep into our family unit and our relationships as it has, I or as it did. I'll tell you what, when you first take the, the, the screen for the first time in that <laughs> series, you know, you are a no nonsense mom that is laying the wall down and this is the way it's going to be. And it sets the tone. Well, I tell you, and Jeffrey, uh, uh, everybody that was involved in it, but I remember Jeffrey directed that episode. And one of the things he was like, pay attention to the script, but throw the skip script away. It's the situation. 
And so the lines were there messing with a white girl after getting in trouble at practice. That line was in there. But I'll let move. Got you coming with me. I'll, all of that was total ad lib. And I was mama bear. You have lost your mind. I don't know where that line came from. <laughs> but that was just, it was a mother going, have you lost your mind? And that's something that I say to my kids or would have said to my kids, you know, telling my daughters, move, get out of the way. Oh, I'd be nice. (laughs) (laughs) You know, some of it was scripted, but most of the things, I can't say most of it, a lot of that show was from the heart. And we had that freedom as actors, uh, which was, I think, um, the biggest gift uh, to give to us as an ensemble was to set those situations up and then let the real heart of the situations ring through. And we could stick to the script tightly or we had room to kind of flow and ebb in those scripts. And that was a beautiful experience. What was it like working with Gaius Charles, who plays Smash Williams, your son? And for those that you haven't seen the series, you got to go check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's a fabulous series. And if you have, then you know that Smash is all about Smash. And here's (laughs) Mama Williams. So what was it like working with Gaius? He cannot be more opposite from Smash Williams. Gaius is the most giving, loving, open, uh, humble, selfless person I have ever met. He is grounded. I remember he called me, I think it was after the confrontation with uh, Coach Taylor when I found the steroids. Not spoiler alert. (laughs) Watch the series. Right. Um, But when I bust into the, the coach's office and I was enraged. I don't know where that came from. I was enraged and it was, it it was just, it was, like I said, they gave us the freedom to do those things. So, you know, you coming with me, come on. And I was frothing (laughs) at the mouth when I got into (laughs) the poor Kyle Chandler. And so I think it was genuine. He was taken aback. He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And at the end of that, that shooting that scene, Gaius reached out to me. He said, Miss Liz, if there's ever anything that you see in, in a scene that I could be bringing more of, please don't hesitate to pull me to the side. Give me some, you know, he, he was just so open and, and he was giving me everything I needed to feel, feed off of. I was taken aback again, I, just like with the B thing. I'm like, me, you asking me? So <laughs> He is the most uh, remarkable young man. Uh, I I always tell him, I try to call him on his birthday, uh, the 1st of May, and I always tell him, your mother did a wonderful job. And he he thanks me. He's he's a wonderful young man. Wonderful. Liz, what did you think of the entire series when you were shooting it? Did you think it would grab on or were you not sure? What happened to us, Tommy, and it always... um, it was just like with Broadway, the changing of the name of our show from Give It Up to Lisa Strata Jones kind of, you know, did something. The fact that NBC didn't quite know what to do with us. I think we came on after. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the series. It was Peyton uh, uh, Hayden Pinotaire and uh, uh, oh, what was the name of that? Oh, series? Nashville. No, 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 no. Oh, no. I love Nashville because Connie was on there. No, this was years later. Nashville came after us. It was um, it was their big thing on a Monday night. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, at any rate, your, your listeners will know. Um, but I think we were supposed to come on after them, which would have or, or either before which that audience and they were they were publicizing the mess out of that show. Oh, what was the name of it? Oh, I can't think. At any rate, they publicized the mess out of it. But we were kind of like the stepchild. So it was Friday Night Lights, but we were on Tuesday. And then it was Friday Night Lights, and we were on Wednesday. And they were like, it's Friday Night Lights. And then finally, they put us on Fridays. And, but they kept moving the time. It was just ridiculous. And then the next uh, season, the writer strike happened. And so with the writer strike, I think that killed some things, but it had developed such a loving base of people that knew it was not just about football. And we did win some football folks, but then there were some other people that were tied into the family aspect of it. 
and the the small town love and community feel of it. And though that was our base. And so they they tended to follow us. Um, and and it would always be shocking to me. They would be like, well, nobody's watching. And it would be like four or five million people. And I was like, that's nobody. But in terms of TV, you know, if it's not double digits, they feel like, you know, they haven't done their job. If it's two or three million people watching, what whatever. But they kept shoving us around and it developed such a base that um, uh, was it USA? I think grabbed it. Direct TV. Direct TV. Uh, they they did a co-pro with NBC. And so they, you could tell somebody loved it out there mm-hmm. that they believed in it enough uh, to, to pick it up and keep it going. And um, I just think that NBC didn't give us the right jolt and belief in in uh, in promotions and promoting it. So we, we was always up and down, up and down. I felt good about it. And then I felt like, oh, well, we, we kept thinking the bottom was going to drop out every season. If the, well, we got that one season in the can. Then they announced the second season. Oh, okay. Then the writer strike happened. Well, we got that in the can. Okay. Then the third thing, I was like, okay, it's going to continue. It, it tugs at every emotion you have if you mm-hmm. follow it, it'll yeah. tug at your heartstrings. It'll make you cry. It'll make the hair on your arm stand up. It'll make you laugh. Laugh. That Landry has a million little quips. <laughs> I'm doesn't I'm telling you that show is something <laughs> else. is just hilarious in that folks. You got to check it out. Like I said, I'll put a link in the show notes in 2008. You did Ruthie Jenkins and welcome home. Roscoe Jenkins written by and directed by Malcolm Lee. The cast included Martin Lawrence, James Earl Jones, Monique, Cedric the Entertainer, Michael Clark Duncan. What was it like for you, Mike Liz? Epps, uh, Nicole Ari Parker. I, the list goes on and on. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like for you Here in again. that? Here again, I was shooting Friday Night Lights at the time. I was doing Friday Night Lights. And when the writer's strike happened, that second uh, season, and because I do theater, I'm, I'm used to getting a weekly paycheck. Every week we get paid doing theater. And my agent at the time, it told me um, the one that was working directly with me under at, at Mary Collins agency, her name was Bridget. And Bridget said, hey, if you'll stop doing theater for a minute, I can get you in TV and film. So Friday Night Lights happened. And then the second season, the writer strike happened and I was sitting at home with no income. Well, I took the IMDB and started looking at productions and pre-productions of things that were happening close to me, you know, in Austin, things shoot in Austin, things shoot in, 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 uh, in, uh, new and, uh, Louisiana and Shreveport. And so I started looking for things and I looked at, and I saw this listing for this movie. It was called the better man at the time. And I called my agent. I was like, look, I'm sitting here not getting a paycheck. You got to send me out. I need to be seen. Something has to happen. So she sent me, to audition for The Better Man. I'm not knowing what it is at the time. Well, then I'm sitting there going over the the sides, over the script, and this man walks by, I see him peripherally. He walks by, and then I walk in the room. It's Malcolm Lee. He says, oh, I've been waiting on you. I said, well, here I am. (laughs) What he had been waiting on was a female counterpart to Michael Clark Duncan in size, height, and Mm. energy. Here I am. Michael Clark Duncan was 6'4", you know, 300 pounds. Here I am, 6'1", close to 300 pounds. I I was the female counterpart to this man. And it didn't hurt that I could, you know, make you laugh, make you cry. And um, and I'm not going to say what they said, but they said they were looking for a big, pretty girl. But anyway, (laughs) (laughs) at any rate, um, when I, I, I my agent called and told me that I had booked it, Again, I'm thinking, oh, it's supporting role. It's going to be fine. And it was supporting role. And for some reason, one day I was just on my computer and I Googled the better man. And it said, the cast for the better man has been announced. And I'm at home by myself. And then I knew it was Michael Clark. I mean, it was um, um, Martin Lawrence and Nicole Laurie Parker. I already knew they were, you know, uh, uh, screened. They were going to be in it. So the next thing I knew, I kept reading and they said, the cast has been announced. And then it said, uh, Margaret Avery. Then it said, James Earl Jones. I grabbed myself. 
it then went on to Monique, Cedric the Entertainer, Michael Clark Duck. I, 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 I was beside myself. And then when it said Michael Clark Duckett, I just jumped up and started running through my house. <laughs> there was nobody there. But I was like, <laughs> does anybody see anybody here? So I went to my agent right before I was to leave to go uh, to Shreveport to shoot. And I was I was auditioning for um, a couple of other things that I, I ended up losing to like Queen Latifah and and uh, Jill Scott and at any rate, I, and I ended up booking the Church's Chicken commercial right before that. Uh, and so I go into my agent. I said, "Well, I said, you know, I play Martin's sister-in-law." I said, "But guess who my sister-in-law is?" And I just set it up nicely. I said, "Monique," and my agent gasped. I said, "And guess who my cousin-in-law is?" Cedric the Entertainer. And I said, and guess who my mother-in-law is? Uh, Margaret Avery. And then I said, and guess who my father-in-law is? And she stood up on the Margaret Avery. I said, James Earl Jones. She reached out and grabbed me. And then I said, and guess who my husband is? And she shook me when I said, Michael Clark Duncan. We were screaming in the agency. (laughs) Unbelievable. I pinched myself when I was on set. Early, we shoot early in the morning. And I was like, Lord, is this my life? Please, I would just pray. Because I, I was sitting in the makeup trailer, like, it, you know, before dawn, getting made up. And in well, I'm sitting next to Margaret Avery and, and uh, Brooke. Uh, oh, what's Brooke's last name? I, she played Michael, uh, uh, Mike Epps' girlfriend. Anyway, we were sitting in the makeup trailer and walks Monique and hugs every single person, hairstylist and, 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 and actor all the way down. And her hairstylist, you know, puts her in the shampoo. It was just unreal unreal it's a great show Um, i'll put another link to that as well and you know what there's something here that is resonating with me we're talking about some big name people that we've already mentioned and oprah and all these other people and now friday night lights and then this show but then because it doesn't end there folks you have this great voice and you have opened for a rock of badu bradford marsalis isaac hayes and mary j blige how does that all resonate with you? Well, I, you know, Erica grew up. Erica Badu is a Dallas native and she gives back to the community. That happened because of a annual um, festival we have here in Dallas called the Harambe Festival. And it was so funny the year that I opened for Erica. Um, I was up with, with Yarborough and Peoples. I don't know if your, your viewers know who that is. Don't you stop it. Don't you stop. Stop the music. They are Dallas natives and dear friends of mine. In fact, they're getting ready to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Don't Stop the Music uh, here in Dallas. And uh, Elisa Peoples from Yarborough and Peoples was playing for me. I was doing some jazz standards and uh, performing at the Harambe Festival. And I was in the middle of my second song, I believe. And some the, the MC stepped up on the stage and, and it was dismissing me. And I was like, are you telling me I have to leave? And the people from the audience were booing. They were like, no, we've been listening to all that, that hip hop stuff. We ready to hear some grown folks. No, no. And, and the, uh, the coordinator was like, oh, give me a break. Give me a break. So they made me sit down. They made me get off stage because Erica had arrived. Now, her band wasn't ready to take the stage. Nobody was there. They, she had just arrived. And I was like, Erica knows me. I've known her since she was a kid. She was a dancer too. And went to Booker T, went to the same high school. I'm older than she is, but I knew her mother. I, we have family friends in common. I've known Erica forever. And finally they were like, get off the stage, get off the stage. And they made me get off the stage. People were complaining. And then the MC proceeded to talk for another 10, 15 minutes. And I'm like, well, if he's up there talking, why couldn't I have still been singing? You know, okay, so the MC gets down, Erica's band takes the stage, and the sound system goes black. (laughs) I was the last voice they heard that day. And the the coordinator even said, he said, well, I guess God is mad at me because I made Liz Michael sit down. (laughs) You let this man talk for another 10, 15 minutes while you made me sit down when I could have still been singing, but your audience didn't get to see it. So... That so opening for her, I guess, was a, a, a the wrong kind of term. I was supposed to open, 
my more recent um, openings or uh, collaborations, and I don't have it on that website, was a, a dear, dear friend of mine who is uh, deceased now. He was a world-renowned blues artist, Lucky Peterson. And uh, I, we performed in um, Paris together for New Year's going into 2018 at Duke de Lombard. And then I followed him into London. I, it was his gig. He just let me sit in at uh, Ronnie Scott's in London. And uh, we brought in the new year here in Dallas for the last two or three years. He passed last year during um, May, May 2020. But we would bring in the new years together every year. But he was world renowned. People travel from all over the world to see Lucky perform, Lucky Peterson. Then I, 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 something else that wasn't on that, that old thing, I know you've made notes, but was my uh, performance as Gertrude in Get, Get on, on up. up. That's so James, that's right. I was actually going to talk to you about Chad that Bozeman. on the extra five one we're going to do after this. So that is on okay, my list. Well, I'll shut up. I jumped the gun. <laughs> uh, let me ask you about this. You were crowned Miss El Centro. Can you explain that whole thing for me, please? Okay. El Centro Community College is a part of a, um, a group of community colleges across Dallas. And El Centro is the very center one in downtown Dallas. And uh, before I went off to a four-year university, I was 17 when I graduated high school. And my mother was like, she's not ready for the world. And so I went to El Centro. Um, it's where I started my dance major and switched it to theater. And they had this uh, pageant every year. Uh, the first year I got in it and, and I did this, I did, I made all of my outfits. You had to, to uh, have different categories of outfits and I, I do so. So I made all of my outfits. I sang, I did a uh, monologue and then I danced. That was my talent portion. And the first year I, I didn't win. And people booed because I didn't win because I did all of those things. And I answered my question. I thought professionally. Uh, I mean, people literally blew, booed. I think I came out second runner up the first year. Well, that didn't deter me the next year. And I I solicited my mother who sold as well. Baby, we were backstage sewing and, and she was getting me ready. And I, so I won the next year. It was a pageant um, that celebrated arts, um, oratory, you know, all of those things that that um, that pageants do. And you had to think on your feet and you had, you know, the, the evening category. You had the sportswear category. Didn't have swimsuit, thank God. But I would have I would have cleaned it out had they had it, <laughs> had they had swimsuit. But uh, it was based, I think, on talent and uh, those other categories and the questions. And uh, it was it was exciting. I was young, 17, 18 years old. How much do you love your career? Oh, Tommy, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed that this little three-year-old girl, I still feel her inside of wanting to do this thing, of wanting to be in the lights, just called to it. It was, it was a, it called to me. It, 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 it called to me and that, Somebody believed that what I had to share from inside was what they wanted to see or that, that it made them feel a certain way. Uh, it still blows my mind that this is my life and I'm so grateful for it. Um, a lot of people will go through life wondering, what's my calling? What do I do with my life? What, what makes me feel special? What's my connection to the world? I never had those thoughts. I always knew God put me here to do what I do. And I'm so grateful for it, that he's allowing me to walk in my light and shine. I always go back to that little song we sang in church. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And that you have, and it has shined brightly, let me tell you. Like I said at the beginning, I'm a fan of your work. I have been honored to have you on the show. And one thing has really stood out throughout this entire interview is you have a very deep creative spirit that comes out in, in your answers, in your work, in your profession. 
it just shines. Like, like you said, that creative spirit of yours comes out. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being on the show. Folks like and I'm crying. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Folks, you got to get to the extra five because we're going to talk about Gertrude and get on up and a couple other things. Rate and review the show. Five stars. Nice comments are always appreciated. And follow me on Instagram at Before the Lights Podcast. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin. <laughs>